okay? I've got the power. All right, now we want to spend most of our time identifying love with a certain kind of life. Because salvation is actually a life. And at, towards the end of the hour, I want to go to our handout that we gave you the other day and just walk over a bit of that and take questions, if, if we can. But now we come to think about love as it is discussed in 1 Corinthians 13. And a good thing to reflect on is just how we feel when confronted with this chapter. Um, because I think it intimidates people, partly because they misunderstand it and they think now they've got to do that. Also, it doesn't fit well into our ecclesiastical context because we hear him saying, if I speak with the tongues of men and an angel of angels. And by the way, it's important for you as scholarly people to understand what an incredible role rhetoric played in the ancient world. Um, and speaking with the tongues of men and angels would be something highly treasured. It isn't just speaking in unknown tongues, speaking in, non, in known tongues. And actually, we do a lot of that in our present world, judging people by their speaking capacity. And uh, too much, if I may say so, in our religious context especially. Um, Paul made a choice in his ministry not to engage that. And when you read, especially 2 Corinthians, where he's talking about his ministry, you see many indications, as well as elsewhere, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, that he deliberately made a choice not to be impressive as a speaker. And if you haven't thought about 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, you want to look at it, because he's there, he's kind of laughing at, him, laughing at himself, pretending he's gone crazy, and uh, he's talking about his accomplishments. And uh, he says in the 10th verse, in effect, here's the rap on me. They say, they say my letters are really something heavy, substantial. Personally, not much. And his speaking stinks. And ask yourself how you would like to go on the Mediterranean circuit with that rap on you. But Paul is very purposive about it. And when he comes to say, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, agape, boy, is he ever carrying a load. And then he goes on. Why is he doing this? Think about why is he addressing these issues? Do I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge? And though I can, I have faith so that I could move mountains. Where do you suppose you got those words? Could move mountains and have not love. I am zilch, nothing. And if I bestow my goods to feed the poor or give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. So if you're you have someone in to candidate for leadership. Are you going to discount all of that? Nothing isn't very much. Hmm? Not very much. So it's a kind of shocking opposition. 
and you understand it's in a context where he's talking about various kinds of capacities, gifts of the Spirit. And actually, when he finishes 13, he goes back to talk about that. He doesn't dismiss gifts of the Spirit. He doesn't dismiss human abilities. He just says, without agape, they don't amount to anything. Now, why is that? That's because agape is the lifeline to the life of God. That's life. Agape is divine life. It is divine power. It isn't that you have to choose between agape and the other things. The other things are fine if they are under the control of agape. Now then, here comes agape. Love suffers long and is kind. Now for many of us folks in our religious circles, that's enough to get us off the train right there. <laughs> Pull the emergency cord and get off. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. <clears throat> what is envy? Envy is resentment to another person because of blessings that they have. It's resentment. It's based on a sense of deficiency in oneself. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. That means you are thankful that other people are better than you. Wait a moment. Yeah. That's why Paul says in Philippians 2 that each consider other better than himself. Love does not exalt itself. It is not puffed up. I love that phrase. Puffed up. Not puffed up. Doesn't behave itself unseemly. Now that's the old language and by the way, I'm a 19th century figure, so I quote the King James. And <laughs> Actually, I think there's some advantages to it as a translation. There are disadvantages as well. What does that mean? Does not behave itself unseemly. Uh, you, you can try various words on it. Love is not a jerk. <laughs> doesn't jerk people around. Love doesn't give people a hard time. Try that. Love does some other things. For example, it doesn't, it's not hard to approach. Not hard to approach, not unapproachable. It doesn't seek its own. Love bears all things. What does that mean? That means when Paul's saying, you know, I've been I've seen that there isn't anything that love can't stand. Believes all things. Hopes all things, endures all things. He didn't say Paul did that, he said love did that. Mm -hmm. right. Love never quits, never fails.
Now, what is important to understand, don't, please don't turn that into a piece of legalism and say, well, I want to be loving, so I will be patient. Well, actually, you can be patient and not be loving. So what you're talking about here is a very uh, deep kind of set of the whole person. <clears throat> and that set itself is a power. Well, let me give you a comparison. <clears throat> Take contempt. Contempt is a structure that enters into people's lives. And then it does things. You can explain why people do the things that I do if you understand that they are a person given to be contemptuous. Anger can be taken into your life as a power. And it will organize your life to a certain extent. And the more you give yourself to it, the more it will organize your life. And people will come to realize you are an angry person. And probably you will also be contemptuous because anger and contempt are very closely related. Love is like that. You take love into your life and you allow it to penetrate your mind and you allow it to penetrate your body and your social setting you subject your will to love that's the center of it we said that's the executive center but as you do this and you live with it it takes over your whole life and in the process lines you up with the commandments of God and that's why Paul says what he does and it was that's why Jesus said what he did because when he said the great commandment are these he was including all of the others in it but now you don't do those because you're not supposed to or not do them because you're supposed to or not do them you do them because of who you now are so now let's take a particular case that's very troubling in our in our world pornography um, this is an increasing difficulty both for men and women it is a curse on the ministry um, just a devastating sort of thing how can you deal with pornography you have to become the kind of person who would not find it interesting. Now you're not going to do that by deciding one day, I'm not going to be interested in that. You do that by coming to think in a different way about yourself. I mean, what are you thinking about yourself when you engage pornography and actually if you think that through or enough that'll cure you on the spot well not on the spot it's a lengthy spot <laughs> you have to go through that but if when at the point when you see what you are doing to yourself to say things like well I've got to do this well, that's not a position for a human being in the image of God to be in. And you begin to ask yourself, why do I do this? What does it mean about my desires and my will and so on? And I just take that as an illustration because, we, I mean, there, uh, people have such a hard time with it. But the hard time is built into the way they think about themselves, about God, about other people under God. And when you see this right, you don't want to do that. 
not in the sense that, oh, I, I want to do it, but I don't want to do it, but in the sense that I don't want to do it. See, that's the training of the character away from something. Now, that's in general true of everything that comes in the way of temptation and sin. Is you reframe the mind and the feelings and your will, because your will training is very important here. Not will worship, like Paul talks about, but will training. You accept the fact that you have to train your will, because if you don't do that, you will not have a place to turn around and start changing your mind, changing your, your um, body and your social relationships, and really down to the level of your soul. Um, you have to, your will has to turn. So that's where now the uh, structure that we want to talk about later, that is in chapter 5 of Renovation of the Heart, the VIM structure. See, the vision is fundamental. But there's an interaction there, because unless you have some degree of intention, you will not readjust your mind. And uh, for example, one of the big problems with pornography is that people, their will is enslaved to their desires and they don't know who they would be if they gave up their desires and they can't find a place in their will to turn and say, to, in so many areas, you have to want to not want what you now want. You have to want to not think what you now think. So that's sort of the minimal motion that, of intention that can help you. And of course, I believe that only the grace of God enters at that point. It doesn't decide for you. Grace and God do not make decisions for you. You make decisions, but there's help. And we can count on that. So now love comes in and seeks what is good, not what you want. And that in itself is a, is a great shift. You come to seek what is good and not what you want. And now then, once you get settled in seeking what is good, you can go back, in many cases, to wants that are legitimate and subordinate them, not in the case of pornography, um, and subordinate your wants um, to what is good, to a will that is surrendered to what is good. That's what love does. It comes in and possesses. So now you don't have to deal with some stuff that was over here in your mind that was not good and not loving because it's not there anymore. So how did you get that there? Well, that involves some work sometimes. And there are processes that you can go through and for a, a Christian who understands the importance of Scripture, uh, they can replace the, a lot of their thinking by Scripture memorization. When you take the Scripture into you, it's a substance, and it is active, and it works. That's one reason why you want it in you. And then it will help you deal with your other thoughts and your desires and replace them. Now that is why the, one of the greatest disciplinary verses in the scripture is Joshua 1.8. This book of the law will not depart out of your mouth. That's a real good place for it. It's in your mouth. And if it's in your mouth, a lot of other stuff won't be in your mouth. So that means you're keeping it up front. When you're standing in line, doing other things, go there. 
This book of the law will not depart out of your mouth, but you will meditate therein day and night, that you may do, observe, according to all, do all that's recorded in that book of the law. Now what will that result in? Then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Well, what's the connection between having the law in your mind and, of course, in your whole personality because it spreads and diffuses? What is the connection? Well, you see, when you have the law in your mind, it directs your action in conformity with the kingdom of God. So you wind up acting with the kingdom of God. That's why you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. It's because you are aligning yourself with the kingdom of God. See, this is a part of the answer to the question, well, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. How do you do that? One way of doing that is to take the law into your mind and dwell on it. Now, uh, there are other aspects of this sort of thing, uh, practicing the will. I mean, a good practice for the will is to have an itch and not scratch it. Can you do that? Now, you might say, oh, I can't do that. Well, you can. It's trivial, I know, but we have to lighten up a bit here from time to time. It's good practice. See a donut and not eat it. And look at the donut and say, what's that to me? Who needs that? See, because a part of what you're doing now in growing in love is coming to grips with your desires, which are not directed in love, by and large. And they have to be brought under. See, the... The Christian teaching is not that desire is bad. It only goes mad when it becomes the rule of your life. So we're not Buddhists and we're not Stoics. We don't think desire is bad. But we know that it has to be subordinated to what is good. And we understand that that is what love does. Love subordinates desire to what is good. The answer to lust is love. Why would I not look upon a woman to lust after her? Because I love her. Just that simple. I love her. Now, someone asked me in the break, am I in lust with my life, with my wife? Am I in love with my wife? And the answer to that is on and off, for about 55 years now, <laughs> on and off, but I have been loving her, and she, much greater testimony to goodness, has been loving me all that time. She loved me when I was not in love with her, and when she was not in love with me. See, and you, you really need to help people understand that. That love, and in love, in love is fine if it's under love. So I've, we've been loving one another all that time. Since we met at Tennessee Temple College. Who is it? Someone here from Tennessee, here, Jason. I went into the library and there she was. I checked her out and never took her back. <laughs> I can still remember the, the sweater she had on, the skirt. And, oh, what a wonderful thing. <laughs> but thank God, um, far beyond our own wisdom, we learn to love one another. And there is, that is where God comes in, you see. That's not a human attainment. And if we have 
that, then we can be patient, we can be kind, not resentful, all those things, because it is love that is in us. So, the point is, if we're going to teach people to do everything that Jesus said, we want to lead them into being loving people. See, and that's why the gospel is so central. God so loved the world that he gave. We understand what that means. And we are led to trust love ourselves. We understand something about, at least, that God is really back of it. And uh, that he will support it. See, if many people feel that if they love, as we're describing it here, then they will experience great loss. And they don't trust love. So they look at the Sermon on the Mount, for example, and see all the things that's listed by Jesus. Well, you know, if you do this and you do that and you do the other. And they say, this would ruin my life. I'm not going to do it. I'll just feel guilty. And I will be forgiven because my sins have been paid for. But to think of actually doing it wipes most people out because they don't understand that it is a part of the life from above that comes upon entry into the kingdom of God. So you can trust it. And you have knowledge upon which you can base your faith. And then you can put your actions into, on your faith, and God will be with you. See, that's the way knowledge and faith and action work. You don't, you don't try to just work by commitment. We have to talk about the difference between belief and commitment and profession, because this really causes folks a lot of trouble. They think, they're, they think they believe something and they don't. They're just committed to it. Or maybe they're not even committed to it. They just profess it. And profession will get you almost nothing. Because usually we profess things without commitment, without belief, and without knowledge. And then when we come down to the facts, we find we don't believe what we professed. And we don't come to understand the strength of faith. So we're going to have to work over these because love is a way of knowledge that provides a foundation for faith. But let me just illustrate it simply with little David when he comes out from the sheepfold and comes up where Goliath is hollering across the valley and saying nasty things about the Jews, Israelites. And David can't understand, why is this going on? Why, why, how could this be? And he says, I'll take care of this guy. And they all treat him like he's an idiot. And, and then he explains to him, says, listen, I've been in these things before. And I know how it works on the basis of my experience. And he tells them about a lion and what happened to the lion. And he tells them about the bear. And he doesn't beat his breast and give the Tarzan yell. <laughs> he says, God help me. Now that was, see, he had knowledge of this on the basis of his experience. And so he said in faith, I will take care of this guy. And faith is where you're ready to act as if it were true. You have faith in something when you're ready to act as if it were true. Like you all have faith in those chairs. I can tell by the way you're sitting there. If you didn't have faith in them, you wouldn't be sitting there that way. So David <laughs> goes out and picks up a few stones and, and does business. Now, he wasn't trusting himself, he was trusting in God, and he acted, and God sustained him. And then after that, he knew more than he did before. 
<laughs> now he knew what happened to the giant. See, that's, that's the way these things work. Now, love is like that. You have to learn to trust it. And if you don't trust it, then what will happen is you'll take things into your own hands and follow your desires. And they may be really nice sounding desires. Not necessarily bad in themselves. But you will not have the action of God with you. That's what is called flesh. Flesh is the natural abilities of the human being. So you go with those. Now, to not go with them is to constantly go with the intervention of God in your life. So when you're faced with a challenge to love, that is, to seek what is good in a particular situation, and not respond just to your fears or even your hopes or whatever, then you make room for God. Now, if you don't make room for God, you'll make room for something else. You remember what it says in Ephesians about anger? Be angry, but don't let it lead you into sin. And that means primarily, don't hold on to it. Anger is like pain. It's not bad in itself, but you wouldn't choose it if you were smart. So you, anger says, hey, something's wrong. Fix it. Don't get caught up in anger. If you do, you will make a place for who? Satan. Make place for Satan. See that? Making a place for Satan, making a place for God. You make a place for God by love acting in faith. Faith working by love. You make a place for God. And that means you're tying in to the life of God. Now that we want to just enlarge on that a bit. Um, we quit at noon, right? Okay. Salvation is a life. Okay. Salvation is a life. It is a life that is tied into God's life. You are born from above. That's how you enter. That's one of Jesus' descriptions of entering the kingdom. You have to be born from above. That means that now you take on a different life. So we need to talk a little bit about life. Life is one of the primary descriptions in the New Testament of what you get when you surrender to God. You get life. Now, what is life? You have to think about that. And now I have, in the spirit of the disciplines, I have quotations and discussions. And I'm just assuming that you can tie in a lot of what I'm saying in these few minutes that we have here with what's in the book. Okay. Life is self-initiating self-directing, self-sustaining activity. Self-initiating, self-directing, self-sustaining activity. Life always occurs in an environment from which the living thing takes in nourishment. Okay, now, just briefly illustrated in ways that you can fill out. A child soon learns what it is for their goldfish to die. And that goldfish, when it dies, 
That's the end of its self-initiating, self-directing, self-sustaining activity. Right? And then, of course, you learn other things about what happens when life departs, the child does. The fish rots. Okay? Why? Because the life that was in it and was organizing its body is not there any longer, and so its body comes apart. Hmm? Now, the life that is in a cabbage is different from the life that is in a kitten. It's true, isn't it? What does that mean? Well, the initiating, the sustaining, the directing is different. If, if your cabbage were to become, become suddenly interested in strings and marbles like a kitten, you would know that something was out of order. It's a different kind of life. And the environment means something entirely different. If you saw your kitten out in the yard eating dirt, like the cabbage does, you'd know something was wrong. Different kind of life. See? That idea of life now is very important. What does it mean to be spiritual dead? You were dead in trespasses and sins. That means that the life that was appropriate to you is gone. You are not drawing from what you should be drawing from. You are not initiating, directing, and sustaining the activities that are appropriate to your nature. The day you eat thereof, you will die. What does it mean? It means you have now cut yourself off from the environment that can sustain the life that you are meant for. So, now your life is going to be different. Right? You have cut yourself off from God. You did that by not trusting Him. And because you didn't trust Him, you didn't obey Him. And now you have pulled up yourself by the roots. And you are in a process of corruption. You are dead. You are in the process of disintegrating. Like a cabbage plant that you pull up and put on the sidewalk. Okay, am I making any sense at all to you? Okay. So now, um, you're born again. That means that a life has re-entered you. This is what Henry Skugol in his great old classic called The Life of God and the Soul of Man. One of the most influential pieces of writing on the evangelical side of modern religion that there is. It's just a few pages. The Life of God and the Soul of Man. It's one of the best things you can ever read if you want to really understand the heart of evangelicalism as a historical movement. Henry Skugel, S-C-O-U-G-A-L. You can get it on the web. <laughs> there are a few good things about the web. <laughs> uh, you will find it very hard to read because these people, they did not make concessions to the reader. But actually, it'll do your mind good because uh, now we're being training our minds to react in little bits and pieces. At USC we have an excellent writing program. They teach you how to write if you have nothing to say. <laughs> but you can write real good. <laughs> Probably get a job writing advertisements. In any case, this is really a magnificent piece and you, if you brace yourself and get a hold of it, and you will see why nearly all of the great 
modern evangelicals like Wesley and the rest of them point back to that book and say that was a landmark in my life. And it's all about now what I'm talking to you about, a life from above. Now, understand, to say that, that means now there is a principle of initiation, of direction, of sustenance. That is not from the natural world. And lo and behold, we are suddenly back to where we started yesterday, the two landscapes. Two landscapes. Though the outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day, while we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen. You see, when you, when you go, those verses in, in uh, Colossians, since you've been risen, since you're risen with Christ, seek those things that are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Now, here's an image for you that. You, you ever see uh, videos of these uh, uh, airplanes that are refueling in flight? It's a great image and that's what you're doing when you set your mind on things that are above. You are actually taking in divine substance and that is the nature of the life of love and it is a reality that comes in and as we learn and we progressively allow it to happen and encourage it to happen and do things that help it to happen and don't get your uh, synergistic blood up uh, on that uh, and think Pelagius is coming in the door uh, because if you don't do something, none of it will happen. You know, when you're dead in trespasses and sins, God takes an initiative not necessarily that you can't do anything, but you won't. And that's enough to fix you, <laughs> just that you won't. So now I'm skating the theological abysses here, but the thing is, anyone who comes to God is going to come to God because God has touched them in some way. But then they have to respond. And God enables them to respond, but not, he does not make decisions for them. He does not. That's one thing you can bet on. God will never make a decision for a human being or a person. You make the decision. And you, you don't say, well, what's going to happen? You know, you're, you're going to go to lunch here in a moment. You're going to make a bunch of decisions. You don't think, well, let's see what, what will happen. <laughs> what will happen is you won't get anything to eat. <laughs> now, if someone didn't provide it, you wouldn't get anything to eat either. And of course, there's a lot that's going on in you and your thoughts and your feelings and so on that you need all of that there. But decision is important. And without it, nothing happens. And you learn to give God the glory for whatever happens. You know this, you progress. And you make a lot of mistakes along the way about this. But you gradually learn that he doesn't share his glory with anyone. And he doesn't do that because it'll kill you if, he, if it does. You, you start taking God's glory to you. You have cut yourself off from God. Now... Um, whether or not what's going to happen to you eventually is a different story, but you can cut yourself off from God and be a born-again Christian. All you have to do is take off on your own. All you have to do is to think you are able in yourself to do what you need to do for God. And he says, okay, since you've got it in hand, uh, I'll let you go. And probably the best thing that can happen is you wind up in the belly of some whale somewhere crying out to God. And that's good. Whale Seminary is one of the best seminaries <laughs> ever been run. So now life. See, life, life has its own rhythms. 
you continue to have a natural life. That's not bad. That's good. If it is under the governance of the life that comes from above. And that life is also love. That's what it is. That's its essence. And so when it moves, it moves at the initiative of love. It moves in the direction of love. As it moves, it is sustained by love. So now, I'm, I'm concerned to communicate that idea of a life. And partly because life is essentially the kind of thing that develops. And that's where we have to spend much of our time now for the next hours. But life essentially is the kind of thing that develops. To be born again is to enter the kingdom. It's not to live in it. You go through the door of the house, you don't live in the door. You live in the house. And living in the kingdom of God is something that requires personal growth, modification of character, uh, learning how to rely on God at the same time as act. To act without relying on yourself. It involves learning that God is sufficient. Such wonderful verses as Psalm 16, 8. I have set the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. See, that's another one of those great verses, like Joshua 1.8, that just says volumes. Okay, how did you set the Lord all you all before you? Well, there, there's something to be learned there. How do you set the Lord before you? And you learn that through a process that is gradual, reliable. It is a way of knowledge as well as a way of faith. But you learn that if you do that, since he is at your right hand, now see, his being at your right hand means that he is acting with you and for you. That's what your right hand is for. It's okay, if you're left-handed, you can say left hand there. <laughs> that'll, that'll do just fine. He is at your left hand. And that gives you the secret of not being moved. What does that mean, not moved? You're not swept away in the currents of life. So let me give you a real tough one here. Suppose you fall in love with someone you're not supposed to be in love with. You may have heard of that actually happening. Now what do you do about it? Well, it depends on what you have set before you. If you have set romantic fulfillment before you, you're probably in high weeds at that point. See, if you have set the Lord before you, you've got something to anchor you so that the emotional flow of things, you will not be moved. You'll not be moved. That means that you have a resource to anchor you so that you don't have to live in denial or in acceptance because you are founded on something solid now. And I know that one of the main tests of the Christian, especially those in leadership, is precisely this sort of thing. And, and we see it around us in the cases, but the, you know, the important thing to understand with the cases, the famous cases, you all know these, it's not what happened that blew the lid off of it. The important thing is what was going on all the time before that. Now see, these folks have made a choice about where to live that ultimately defeats them. And they, they're confronted with something, no doubt with a little help from the enemy. 
who's always working on these things and there they go. So I have set the Lord always before me, always before me. He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Now that's a way of handling the resources. See, when you do that, when you set the Lord always before you, you are consuming the fuel of a godly life. That's what you're doing. You are refueling in flight. You know, some years ago they invented these little robots that when their batteries were running down, they would just go plug themselves in. Yeah. Until they got recharged. And that's what we learn to do. But not on just an emergency basis. We want to do that. I mean, there are emergencies. At Ziklag, on one occasion, they were about, Joe, David's own people were about ready to kill him. It's not unknown for leaders to be in that position. And a wonderful line there says, he, he strengthened himself in the Lord. And you wonder, what did he do? Probably went off on a rock and sung a few psalms to himself. See, he set the Lord before him. He knew how to strengthen himself in the Lord. He knew when he had to do it. So there are emergency situations is what I'm saying. But we want to take, usually, if you're not in a solid characterological constant position, then when the emergency hits, you won't know what to do. It's very important to keep the constant flow going. And the Psalms are full of that, of course. The first Psalm, blessed is the man. And it goes on to say essentially what is said in, the, in Joshua 1.8. But now my, my point in all of this, don't please don't lose it, is you are taking in life. You are taking in life from above. And that is absolutely crucial now if you are going to live the life of love in the kingdom of God. And then when you are going to teach others to do the things that Jesus said, you're going to teach them how to do the same thing. What is the person thinking who blesses those who are cursing them? What kind of soul, what kind of mind, what kind of relationship to others See, if you don't understand that, then you're just, you, you're saying, okay, whenever someone curses me, I'll do it. God will inject me with infused grace at the moment. You know, sometimes he does that. But he will not regularly do that. Now, if you are preparing yourself, see, if you're going to bless someone who is cursing you, like Jesus did on the cross, you have to be full of blessing. So when someone punches you, what comes out is not cursing because there ain't no cursing in there. You've done got that out. You're not into pronouncing evil on persons. Your mind knows better. Your feelings go in a different direction toward them. You think about your relationship to them differently. Your soul has got it all put together in such a way that you can actually do what you intend to do, which is bless them. Am I making any sense at all to you? Okay. See, my emphasis is upon the system and how love moves into that system and brings with it a life. And then out of that life, the things which Jesus taught routinely and easily flow. So if you can't love someone the way that would be uh, God-pleasing to love them, then 
the resource that you have is you can release that person to to having God. To That's a good. Letting God love yes. them through you. Right. That's a good thing. But now, you also want to say, well, I, there's something in me that needs to be changed. And so you back up now, and you don't go into great gobs of guilt. Uh, because you are forgiven. And you know that that's not the issue. So now you do, you release the person to God. If you can't do anything else, you can do that. And actually that's a kind of blessing because if they are placed in the hands of God, that's going to be a good thing. I'm um, so, speaking. Uh, aren't you actually loving that person? By you are doing the best you can. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No, I, I, look. What you said. What you said is very good, but you have to accept that. That's the best you can do to love them now. And at a certain point, your body rebels if it's not into love. And um, so you you are limited because you are finite, and this whole system is still working. So you do the best you can in any circumstance. What I'm just saying to Ingrid's very important point uh, is that now don't just stop there. Go back and see what, why was it I wasn't able to do more. And that gets you off of that particular issue and the particular action. And now you're thinking, now the answer is going to be, well, I don't have an adequate vision of myself and the people around me under God. See, when you bless someone, you will their good under the invocation of God. Now, you have to have a vision to do that. You have to have a body that's not already cursed them before you start <laughs> thinking about it too. But you're probably okay on that. And so if, if one has a problem, I mean, take a case where you're really injured by what someone has done. Now, you have to have a lot of resources to sincerely bless them in that circumstance. You have to have a lot of, you know, you're going to do a Stephen here at some point, who's going to follow his Lord by asking that they be forgiven. And you may need the heavens to open to do that. Open heavens is an interesting concept. I don't know that we'll get around to talking about it, but when the heavens open, you see what was there all along. You see what was there all along. Ezekiel, the heavens open. Uh, he was in a circumstance where he needed to see that. And he saw what was there all along. We started out with the two landscapes yesterday, you remember, and we talked about Elisha and his butler. And Elisha said, Lord, let him see what's there all along. He didn't say, trot up some chariots of fire. No, no, they're already there. And now, our, that, now that's a, a part of what goes into setting the Lord always before me.